coming back after lunch. I hope you all had something to eat um, and watered. This is the second and final session. And it's where we move into much more detail about the, the practicalities um, of the treatment and the complexities of the treatment. So we're starting to dig down now right into the nuts and bolts of the maps, why they look the way they do, why they behave the way they do, and what kind of cajoling the team needed to do to get them to um, take their place in the future. So our first... Um, Yes, moderator is Libby Meltzer. Um, so Libby, if you want to come up, Libby's paper heads the paper conservator team at Greenway Conservation Services. And Libby was a project manager for the um, MAP project. Thank you, Libby. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all very much for coming back to our, our session this afternoon. Um, as Robin said, my name is Libby Melzer. Um, I'm head of uh, the paper conservation team at Greenway Conservation Services, and I have had the absolute privilege of being the lead um, on uh, both the conservation projects for the, the blow warm ups. So uh, these projects were, were not just long, and that they were very long. It was about five years of our life that we spent um, looking at, at blow warm ups. Um, but they were, uh, they were complex and they required a lot of complex sort of decision-making along the way. Uh, and not just about how, what we did to conserve the objects, but also about um, our understanding of them. And one of the things that we, we had to do to sort of position our understanding of the maps and, and what they meant, well, what I should say we had to do, we were lucky enough to be part of, was to get a lot of insight from the people you heard speaking this morning. So initially Martin, who, who was really, really integral, obviously in, in not just the, the acquiring of this map, but in making sure that we as the conservation team knew what this, this map meant. We knew about its history and we knew what was important about it. And when you have to make complex conservation decisions, it isn't always, it isn't always straightforward. You have to make, you have to prioritize things. You have to make, some, some choices that, that could go one way or the other. Um, and this was a really, really incredibly useful thing to have this kind of insight and background in order to sort of position those choices. Um, and then as we, you know, reached the end of this project, uh, Robin was the person who initially suggested, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a symposium to kind of talk about all, all of this detail. Actually, I shouldn't say all of it, to talk about a small amount of the detail because there was far too much to include in here. Um, and when this was pitched, the first thing I thought was, wouldn't it be fantastic to have Martin and Jane in particular in a room speaking to each other? Because we had conversations with them both separately. And I just thought this is a conversation that I really wanted to be present for. And Erica was of course the central, the, the third voice in that. And so um, I feel like it was just a really, really wonderful coup that we were able to get all three of them together. Um, it was a conversation I wanted to be present for. And I'm so pleased that all of you guys got to be present for that discussion as well. So to introduce you to, I guess, the conservation of these maps, I might, I'll start by introducing you to um, the material of, materiality of maps and how they, um, how, how we saw them before we met these maps. So we, we see maps a lot in all sorts of different forms. They come through the conservation labs all the time. And I just realized it still says I'm Robin, so it'll go on to me. Um, so just to start at the very, very basic principles, in the simplest forms, this is usually what we see for something like a map. You know, so it's a, as Martin said, it's the, it's, you take the original, you know, the original drawings and it's an impression that's been made that is then reproduced and then is disseminated. And we often see this in the simplest form, something like this. So a simple, this is from the um, university collections, um, a simple map that, um, would in its material and form fit very much into what we would normally do in paper conservation. So it's nothing in the materials itself is, is surprising or complex, but maps themselves already have a level of complexity when you even get at this very, very basic level in conservation. There is a lot of discussion that goes on about whether you should wash maps. And for those of you not familiar with paper conservation, we, we wash paper all the time. And there's a lot of benefits to the preservation of paper if we wash it, you know, you get, you get a, you improve the appearance, you improve the chemistry, you improve the physical properties of it. 
But with maps, there's the whole debate on whether or not you should wash maps because are you affecting the, um, the dimensions and the ratios of things? So already at the very, very simplest level, a printed map is not as straightforward as a lot of other items on paper. And then of course, we start seeing things that have got the printed form and then the hand embellishment on it. So already you've got something that is not just a single, you know, you know, reproducible form. It's not the same. It's individual already in this stage by the addition of color. And this is once again a map from the rare map collection, David, um, in the um, at the University of Melbourne. And so already here you can see, you know, not just we have to not just take into account the paper and the ink, but then we have all these hand colors. And the colors are something that are, are very important and ended up being very important to us because of their individual chemistry, which is different to the chemistry of the paper. Another thing that gets us with, with maps all the time is, is their form. So they don't just appear as sheets and as we're going through wall maps, they also appear in things like in books. So you can see you've got something like this that might complicate the conservation and display of a map. So maps in books, we see these a lot and they have their own issues in relation to handling and display and damage. And they have issues then to do with their context. So obviously we could better preserve the map itself if we took it out of the book but then if you take the map out of the book then it's a lesser thing than if it was together so there's a lot of complexity that goes in how you might store and display and conserve these things and the question of original components and of keeping something original together was also a uh, an issue that we had to confront with these map projects as well so we were already familiar with wall maps before we met the first Blau map, but usually in this kind of form. So usually something like this, so a 19th or early 20th century wall map. Uh, Peter can, is smiling because he knows this map very well, the Shire of Mansfield map. Uh, so this is something probably is similar in scale to the Blau wall maps, um, but much simpler. You know, you've got a printed surface, a printed image on paper, lined onto to fabric with battens on the top and bottom and a varnish. So. In a lot of ways, that was very similar to the National Library flower wall map, which had a lot of those components. And here we can show you the amazing work that Peter did and how nice it looks. Um, in this, I would like to draw your attention to several aspects. So you can see, or if I point up here already, you can see that line through there and the line through there. So you can see already, and there's another one that's fainted through there, but this wasn't a single piece of paper. This was numerous pieces of paper put together. Um, which in once again, I'd like you to hold that thought in your mind when I start introducing you to the, the structure of the first, the first flower wall map. Um, another type of way that we see maps, and thank you Erica for providing this image from my Stokes collection. Um, another material that we see all the time is parchment, also called vellum, which is an animal skin product. Um, and you can see in this in particular, so parchment is an untanned skin product. So it's very, very reactive to changes in, in humidity. And so you can see the very, very unique mounting system that gets used to compensate for the materials in this kind of, um, this kind of object. I need to say we didn't do this conservation treatment. This was done by the National Library's um, conservation team. Um, but we do do this technique for, for um, maps on parchment and it's a so for um, objects on parchment single leaves on parchment and the reason for that is the threads expand and contract conversely to the map itself um, so you know so while the parchment expands the threads contract and it keeps it under a little bit of a little bit of tension which is how parchment likes to, to to live like how it likes to be it likes a little bit of restraint um, we also saw maps in this form. So this is the Colossus Globe from mid 19th century. Um, and you can see once again, similar kind of issues in different forms than we would see with, with the Blau map. So you've got something with a, a complex substrate, in this case, metal and plaster, a printed map on the surface. You've got a degraded varnish. So once again, on a pack colored paper surface. So once again, this was a similar, similar features that we were, we were used to dealing with that you would see with the, um, the, the Blau maps when they started to arrive. And so with this one, this was, um, had the varnish removed um, and a lot of the paper repaired. So consolidated, stuck down, losses in fields, a lot of the same processes that were then building up to the Blau wall maps. One thing I should say, going back to the issue of color, this was one of the first, um, 
uh, situations, I guess, when you started seeing the issue of the, the complex issues of color in the maps. So in this case, the green turned out to be arsenic based. Um, and the issue of the green pigments on maps is something that has followed us through um, all of the Blau wall maps. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So now I bring you to this. So this is the National Library's um, Blau wall map as it arrives to us. Having already gone through one stage of conservation treatment with the National Library team to, to take it to a state where it could be included in the um, Mapping the World exhibition. So to bring you back to the features, um, it's, it, did, it did arrive with battens, which had already been removed by the time it came to us. So it had timber battens on the top and bottom edge. Um, it has, you can see, a degraded <coughs> yellow varnish. It had not just one linen lining, but in this case it had two linen linings, so one after the other. So it was very stiff and it was very, very brittle. And I think someone mentioned plastic bags and fragments. So we received the plastic bags of fragments as well. Um, so it really couldn't even be put vertical without the risk of losing, of losing a lot of material. So for the early stages of its um, conservation with us, actually for almost the entirety of its conservation with us, the map stayed flat. Uh, even to take this documentary photograph, I think we got permission to put it at about a 45 degree angle. And then we tracked over the surface with a camera at 45 degrees, just in order to get us a documentary image to move forward. So if, I, if you remember the Mansfield map that I just showed you, uh, as far as the paper structure, this was the paper structure of the NLA's flower map. So you can see here, you've got the six sheet comprising the engraved map in the center. Around the edge, you have the text panels. So the French down here, the Latin at the bottom, and the Dutch at the side. So the text panels were letterpress and the banner was woodblock printed and that was in four parts. So it was 40 pieces of paper altogether. So already you've got an incredibly physically complex structure going on. And once again, this was something that was going to come back and haunt us a bit because in our initial testing, we didn't really take into account the fact that the, the kind of paper that you print an engraving on is very different to the type of paper that you print letterpress, the type of paper that you print woodblock printing on. So while, and I think Brian will talk about this much more in depth, uh, while our initial testing, you know, in, in discrete areas showed one thing, testing in the text panels didn't necessarily apply to what we were able to do to the map surface and definitely did not apply to what we were able to do to the banner. So from piecing together the bits and pieces of the map, so we looked at a very, very detailed way and looked at um, how each of the components sat together. And we were able to put together kind of a rough chronology with a very, very big window in the middle there, but sometimes between its construction in 1663, and at arrival at, um, in Sweden in 2010, we, because we could look at, sorry, I should say this more clearly, um, we could see where the varnish sat in relation to the paper, and we could see where damage sat, whether it sat above and below the varnish, or whether it sat above or below the different linings. Um, and we could also see, um, we could also marry up the holes in the top edge, the holes in the buttons to, to figure out where each of these components sit. And this is our rough kind of sequence of events that happened somewhere in that, that very large gap there. So um, there was damage at the right edge that predated the battens and the trim being lost. Um, the second lining and the varnish were applied after that. There were more losses to the paper and there were pairs at the lower edge and the new lower batten was applied. So we did an awful lot of examination to see what we had going on. There was a huge amount. A lot of this was carried out um, by our team, but also we had um, uh, conservation scientists working from uh, Vermont Academics, so Caroline Chi and Stephanie Alexander, uh, who both worked with us. And if you can see here, this is just examination of the map and the different lighting sources that reveal different things. So this is just taken with visible light, showing all the, you know, the discoloration and staining, and you can see all this damage along the coastlines here. This image here is taken with ultraviolet light, and you can see here, this is the varnish that's fluorescing yellow onto the light. And that feature of the varnish became really, really important to us as well too, which once again, Peter will go into in more detail, one or the other, the next talk about which 
about how we remove the varnish and in order to remove it in such a way that we are incredibly precise rather than you know drifting into the highly damaged areas. The other thing the ultraviolet light showed very clearly is this, this darkened area here, and that was the extent of the vertebrae damage, which is our second vexatious green pigment. And the final image here on the right is taken with infrared. And sorry, this is blurry. That's not the picture. That's just a bit of a feature of the infrared photography, unfortunately. But what the infrared showed, which was really, really wonderful, was that underneath the degraded varnish and embedded in all of that vertigree damage was that the ink was still there. So that's Blau's own you know, impression of the map still present. So as part of the examination, we did, um, uh, we did actually several more tests beyond this, but this was a really, really important one. This is XRF, so you can see here, which is just X-ray fluorescence. So this is a piece of technology that allows us to, in a very localized and non-destructive way, identify um, inorganic pigments. So basically the text elements, and it's a really, really useful tool. And you can see what you uh, arrive with here. It's a spectrum, and the spectrum gives you an elemental, is that the peak is distinctive for a particular element, and that allows us to identify um, inorganic pigments. It's not as useful for organic pigments, obviously, but um, we had some other tools for that. So on the basis of that testing, plus we also were able to on some of the loose fragments doing things like FTIR and microscopy and microchemical testing, we were able to identify like the, the extent of the color scheme of the map underneath. And you can see here already, once again, the level of, of complexity. So we had um, the coastlines, we had where they were fully black. The presence of copper, uh, was apparent to us, made it apparent what we had there was vertebrae, so copper-based pigment, a very unstable copper-based pigment, I'll talk about that a little further, um, that was fully degraded to black. So in those black areas, it would previously have been green. Uh, we also found underneath, in certain places, particularly low, below the ships, like where it would have been the water, we found a combination of copper and lead, uh, which is defined as a traditional way, of once again, using vertebrae over white. Um, to give that sort of synchrony look. We also found more copper um, and using FTI, we found a present of carbonate, which identified that we had a second green, which is malachite. Uh, we had um, in some of the reds, we had mercury, which is indicative of vermilion, and we had iron and other reds, indicative of like uh, a red body. So, and what we also found quite extensive amounts of was lots and lots of gold small points picking out gold all the way through it so things like along the title banner all of those letters originally were fully gilded and little points of gold all the way through so you can see down here like in one of the ships so it was very beautiful so it's, it's interesting to go from that sort of um you know it's current sort of dark and almost burnt looking state to what would originally have been incredible vibrancy and these bright points of gold so this one, I'm going to digress slightly just to talk a bit more about vertigree. So vertigree was, it was our constant companion through the first and the second map. So vertigree is a very early vibrant green pigment. It was sort of the most available vibrant green pigment up until, you know, sort of the mid 19th century. So it's, it's uh, basically copper acetate. So it's known way back from classical times, the Romans used it. Sheets of copper over vats of wine, you get corrosion products, that are formed from the vapors and that corrosion products are bright green. And to show its consistency of use, this is the manuscript from the State Library. So it's both the State Museum, it's the oldest scale manuscript in uh, an Australian collection. And here you can see the vertigree and the vertigree damage happening. So vertigree had two, there's two features that we think about vertigree. The first that it, is that it's unstable. So it degrades. It oxidizes from the bright green to the black that we can see on the coastline. So the map. The other thing is it has a really, really specific interaction with paper in that it catalyzes the degradation of paper. And so this was a very important issue for us to deal with in both in both Lama projects. Because while the National Library's Lama had all that sort of charring caused by the, the degradation of the damaging property of the copper. We didn't want to, we wanted to be sure that we weren't making it worse. 
and then the second in that project, we wanted to be sure that we weren't catalyzing that to start happening. So tracking, checking for copper and tracking how we were moving copper around in the object became like a really critical aspect for us through the whole process. So you can see here, just to show you more clearly, this, this charring effect here is what I'm talking to. You can see all these losses here. And so if we were to, in, in copper that wasn't you know, fully oxidized, if we were to then migrate the copper from these points out into the rest of the paper, we could potentially extend that damage further out. And so the reason that the National Libraries now have this fairly extensive um, copper damage is almost certainly because of the subsequent layers of things like varnish and second line that were applied, thereby introducing moisture, thereby spreading the damage. Now introduce you to the second, the companion maps. So you can see already that this gel map is very, very different from the other gel map. And this was one of the things I think that immediately kind of resonated with me were these two objects that had this very similar starting point and that they diverged almost immediately in their life. And you can see from, you know, the no varnish, it's got the original battens, which are sort of red and black with the banding around them. It has the silk fringes down the side. It only has a single lining, but you can see almost immediately, you can see the reason why the other one has a second lining, which is this type of damage here. And I'll click on to the next map. So this is the companion map of Asia here. And you can see both of them have this really extensive damage down this side here. And you can see here the original, amazing original silk tassels as well. And one thing I have to say is that um, these maps have kind of got so much skin, so understanding their materials. It's only when we're preparing for this um, this presentation, the last presentation was at the day, Tori, who is going to be talking about, um, she, she <laughs> recorded it because she's away, but she was talking about recreating the silk tassels. It was only in her presentation that she mentioned that um, that she thinks that these are originally gold and red, and the same with the fringe, so that they're faded red rather than this golden kind of beige that they are at the moment. And you can imagine how optimum that would be. So, the structure was very, very similar, as you can see. Um, a little bit simplified, it was missing obviously the banner, which means you don't have a definitive date for this map. Um, and also, the visual the, map had these little kind of I don't know if they were corrected text or something, but small patch of uh, other text on three of them. This is missing from this as well, too. So um, I think it's about 33 pieces of paper, but already complicated in, in many, many different ways. Uh, once again, with all the opulence of the tassels and the fringe and the battens, the colour scheme on this map is actually simpler. It's much simpler compared to the the National Library map. So we just had one red there, which is an iron based one, so an ochre. And here we have lead and copper. So I'm not sure, I think it's probably an organic red. Um, I'm not sure where copper comes from. The lead is obviously lead white. Lead white there, and then more in the verdigree and the um, and lead there. We couldn't do as much in depth testing on these maps because we had to make them time. And on the battens, we have vermilion. Um, and red lead on the front there, the gold, and then the calcium is showing you that we certainly like a, a, a gesso layer underneath. And then they were a little bit cheap. They just did the gold doesn't extend onto the back, and neither does the vermilion. It's only red lead on the back. We also found that this map had basically iron throughout. So there was iron residues across all surfaces, including in the, the fringe. So we're not sure if that was a mordant or if it was um, just in combination. And I'll go back to this picture show now that everyone has used, but I'm, I want to use it for, for one very specific reason here is what I want to do is draw your attention here to this in the image here, this beautiful drapery. One, of the fact that we crack in, but secondly, the beautiful way that the map drapes. So it's not a it's not a stiff rigid thing, it's soft, flexible thing. And so the National Library map was obviously with its varnish and second line is very stiff and very rigid. The companion maps. So if you can see here, this is how because because these maps had been hung on the wall, we knew that they could go vertically. So we were able to work on the front and the back of these maps in in succession. And every time we turned the map back to the front, 
And you can see from that how fine and how much movement they have. And so they had that great ready to see in the room of the two that, 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 that sort of um, we really wanted to retain that as a feature of I hope that's an introduction to all to um, for why why these maps were were so complicated. So in their materials and in their structure. Um, and I think one of the things I would take out of this um, for me was this idea. So the, the two maps came in very, very close, like to the extent that the second, the companion maps were advertised for sale by Sotheby's before the, the National Library map left. So they crossed over in that sense. And so when the then on brought the, you know, sent, had the had the second maps sent to us, you would think that having a um, conservation treatment of the first map would provide you with skills to do the conservation treatment of the second map, the companion maps. And the honest truth is what you said. That's what you said. <laughs> and I was wrong. <laughs> because besides the structure and the scale, they were very, they were so different in their materials and the approaches were so different. And I think that's one of the reasons, once again, that I really thought the symposium was, was so important, was because I think it really is. I, I came away with this idea that, you know, so if you've conserved one Dutch 17th century Dutch format, as far as I can tell, that means you've conserved one 17th century Dutch format. And if a, a fourth one walks through the door, chances are it means something to come. So at this point, I'll pass over to our next speakers. So Bryony Pemberton and Peter Mitchelson. So these are these are my old friends and companions, Peter and Bryony. And Peter has had a long association with, with all of the maps. So Peter was actually at the National Library when the National Library map came through the conservation lab there and was back with us by the time it arrived here. And yes, yeah, so he's he'll never seen the end of it. Um, so just to give you his background, so Peter's worked with us, Greenway Conservation, for nine years. He's a conservator of paper and books. Um, he's been involved in the treatment of all the Blau, Blau maps. He's also worked at Art Lab, um, the National Library. Um, and he not just, um, uh, he didn't just do the conservation of the first map, which we, he will speak about now, but he also uh, couriered it. He also traveled with it back to it, got handed over to the National Library, so he saw it back in place. Um, and Bryony Pemberton. So Bryony has been a conservator for over 23 years. Uh, she left us between the maps. Um, someone might want to ask her if that was anything related. Um, and she, but she now runs her own private business uh, down in, in Geelong. So, uh, and Bryony was really instrumental in, in both maps, in, in well, actually in, in for both the companion maps and this map in really kind of nailing down and getting our processes really, really tight in the first instance. Um, so she trained at Campbell College of Arts in London and also worked at the Tate, um, Tate Gallery before coming to Australia. She's been a conservator at the State Library of Victoria, the State Library of New South Wales, the NGV and the Museum of Victoria. Um, so I'll now pass over to Peter and Bryony. Hello everyone. <clears throat> so I've come up from Wadaran country today, which is Geelong. And I just wanted to acknowledge the, um, the traditional owners who've inhabited and cared for this land for tens of thousands of years. So to the map, over 2016, 2017, while still working at the Greenway Centre, I was involved in the treatment of a lifetime. The National Library's Archipelagus Orientalis Sieve Asiaticus, of which you are now very familiar. I've seen this a few times today as well. Uh, as you can imagine, something so rare and so old and so significant doesn't come up for treatment very often, especially in Australia and especially in private practice. And it was a great privilege, but it wasn't easy. Partly because of its age, there were complex problems that needed solving and a lot of our standard methods of paper conservation went out the window. Thankfully, I wasn't doing it alone. It was a very collaborative project, as you've heard already. Um, so I had Peter, my partner in Brian, <laughs> and I had, we had Libby Melzer, the unflappable Libby, leading the group. And we had input from the NLA staff, from conservation scientists, and from our um, Greenway conservatives from other disciplines. 
And yes, it was a long treatment and there were lots of twists and turns. So I can't go into every step. So please ask questions if you feel that you have, have something to say that I might have left out. So yes, it was a cold Canberra morning in May when the map made its way down the Hume Highway to the remote centre in North Melbourne. That's, and this is what we saw when we opened the crate. Um, as Libby said, the NLA conservators had done some stabilizing for a, um, <clears throat> for a display, but it was still very fragile. There was still this brittle yellow varnish and the third degree damage and lots of bits of paper just cracked and kind of lifting up. So very fragile. And we didn't want to breathe too closely over it or parts of the Tasmanian might just float, float away to the floor. Um, so in developing the treatment proposal, uh, as well as doing our own sort of examination and um, assessment and testing, we read widely about how other conservatives had treated similar maps with similar issues. So yeah, we were sort of looking into how people have treated memory varnish, how they treated the third degree. And I had a uh, correspondence with a conservator from Sweden who'd restored a map, a, a similar Dutch map from 1636. And we also had discussions with the NLA about their expectations for the treatment. So this is what we came up with. We didn't want to change the essence of the map. It was very, we wanted to just, we wanted to show that it was old and that it was a wall map. So we didn't want to remove the original lining, or flatten the life out of it, or infill all the losses. So we were interested in ensuring the map was as stable as possible to give it the best chance of surviving well into the future. We wanted it to be exhibitable, exhibitable. so we wanted it to look good, not as new, but we wanted it to, to look cared for and readable. And a big aspect of the treatment ended up being the removal of the varnish, which we wanted to do to increase the clarity and legibility of the text and the print, and also to improve the flexibility of the map so that it was less susceptible to cracking and um, further damage. And then we wanted to stabilize the vulnerable areas of the paper, so the little bits that were sticking up, they needed to be stuck down, basically. And of course, this third degree issue, that um, we wanted to look particularly at this. So we wanted to find out if the pigment was still degrading, and if so, did we need to slow that degradation process down? Um, and we needed to know whether potential conservation treatments might speed the degradation up or move copper around in the paper. As Libby was saying, sometimes you can get um, free copper ions, so copper two ions, which will move laterally through the paper just with humidification. So the verdigree question. Um, answering these questions would dictate what we could and couldn't do. So we, we looked at this first, seen something similar, I think, in Libby's slides, but just yeah, this um verdigree that was used all around the coastline. So all the coastlines just have these areas of bare paper where the pigments literally burnt through the cellulose of the paper. So yes, we used the information from the conservation scientists, their report, and they had done their examination and they weren't able to locate any verdigree pigment that was still a green colour, only brown based products, brown based copper products. They surmised that all the verdigree pigment on the map has degraded entirely to copper oxide. And any green pigment still visible on the map is likely to be malachite, which um, Libby was saying malachite is uh, still a copper green, but it's more stable. So this was interesting, and we wanted to support it a little bit further before we started our um, treatments. So if you've been wondering about what this little white dot is, it's a agarose disc which um, we used in order to see whether there was still mobile copper moving around in the paper. So this little disc is like a, made from seaweed, 
And it's like a miniature sponge. So we worked out that it can suck up free copper and then we can analyze the little disc and see if there's any or in the disc. So it's a way of sort of doing non-destructive analysis. And we use these discs in different parts over the vertebrae damage. And the good news was that we didn't get any free copper coming up. So this told the story, which is what the scientists had said, was that the vertebrae had come to the end of its degradation point. It was copper oxide, which meant that it was um, insoluble and inert. So in terms of conservation, this meant that treatments to halt the degradation process were not necessary and that introducing moisture with the treatments was going to be safe. Moving on, this is me and Libby working on the next challenge, which was how to remove the varnish. Drawing again from the scientific analysis, we knew that the varnish was a plant resin, a natural plant resin known as mastic, and that it would be soluble in ethanol. So we tried some different applications of the ethanol on a swab, just rolling over the surface like paintings conservators do. And we tried a solvent vapor chamber, and we tried a combination of solvents, so ethanol and white spirit. And also we tried it in a gel known as Cruso G. And none of these were particularly successful. Um, we found actually that the Cruso G gel pushed the varnish, sort of dissolved it, but pushed it further into the paper. But we did like the concept of a gel because a viscous gel would move into sort of the nooks and crannies and soften the varnish everywhere to get an even varnish clean. Uh, so we looked into another gelling agent called xanthan gum, which um, is a new material for conservation. It's been a lot, used a lot in the food industry, um, but yeah, there wasn't much information about it from the conservation literature. So we did some reading about it, um, and I contacted an expert conservator um, who knows a lot about gels in America, and he was saying that xanthan is very similar to the um, physical makeup of paper. So in terms of residues being left, you don't need to worry about that. And that also it's very, um, the residues are very easily removed. So we always apply these kind of um, principles when we conserve things in terms of what materials we're going to use and whether they'll have, you know, good or bad impacts on the paper that we're treating. So the beauty of the xanthan gum, it's not like blue cell, it's it's a water-based gel, but it can hold solvents like ethanol and white spirit within the gel. So it was so effective in this case because we could hold the ethanol kind of above the varnish and then it would gently soften it rather than sort of driving it into the paper. So this is the one test that we did with the xanthan um, over tissue to try and reduce residues. So in the end, the tissue didn't work and we had to use it directly onto the the work. So this is a close up of the text panels and you can see how yellow it is and how it sort of obscures the text. <laughs> this is the xanthan gel in progress. So you put on the gel, you kind of let it sit for um, maybe five to 10 minutes, Peter. Yeah, and then it's softened enough so that you could remove it gently without too much sort of vigorous action. So we were very happy that we reached one of our goals to make the um, map more clearer and legible. And we also found this it's going on, oh, beautiful whitish paper underneath. Like we didn't know that it was going to be so beautiful still. And that's what you get from these old papers often. They're made with actually more stable uh, materials than paper is made for now in the 19th century. When we moved to the centre of the map, it was a different story. Our test had shown that the xanthan would be effective, but we started it and the xanthan was too, um, almost too wet. And so because the paper was different in the centre because it was um, an engraved map rather than a letterpress, yeah, the paper was different and it sort of got disturbed by the, the xanthan gel. So we went back to the drawing board and we started looking into whether scratching was going to be a good um, technique. We thought about it before, but um, we were worried it would sort of damage the fragile paper. So we had a eureka moment. We were trying to problem solve out, okay, scratching, it did kind of cleave off quite well with the scalpel. Um, 
but the eureka moment came when we thought, Peter, thought, let's use a UV torch to show us exactly where the varnish residues are and let's use magnification while we're at it. And then we really got a lot of control over how to remove it and how to do it safely. So yeah, <laughs> this is Peter on the scalp with the UV torch, with the optimizer, the head magnification. And he was up there for a long time, I was as well. I mean, it was important given that we couldn't put it upright. We had to support ourselves some way to get to the middle. So we, it was important to think about these things and create a comfortable, relatively comfortable working environment for our heads with cushions. And Peter's got his gloves to protect his hands from the UV. And we also wore UV goggles kind of under the optimizer. <laughs> it was a lot to, to kit up. So, but it was successful. And yeah, we were happy that we weren't um, taking too many risks and causing more damage. Um, and we did swab after the scratching to kind of remove the, the grains that we released, um, the grains of the varnish. So, probably talked enough, and I'm going to hand over to Peter to go into the rest of the treatment of the funnel. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, traditional landowners in which we gather today. Um, and thanks for all the speakers this morning, too. It's really uh, interesting to hear the historical background of the map that we worked on, um, the creators of the map. And it struck me that, um, you know, the Blau, we just hear about Blau, but he would have had so many people in his workshop um, putting a map like this together. So um, we can really relate to that as conservators because we're very much um, hands-on and in a workshop working in a team. Um, I really, the, it was tough on the body, being up on the scaffold, but I also really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it could just, um, it's kind of relaxing. Our lab's incredibly busy. Um, it was, I, I remember this time being really busy and um, I, it was, I could just climb up the scaff and, and scratch away. So it was kind of, it was tough on the body, but it, it was also um, nice to be a little bit elevated. You didn't have to answer the phone, that kind of thing. So yeah, pros and cons. This is just a grid um, that we created and each day we'd fill in, because it's hard to keep track um, of where you're at day after day, particularly when you're up on the scaff and you're just looking at it in detail. So um, we just mark off each day how we were tracking. So the V's is just where we've scratched varnish and I think there's an S in some of them, maybe top right corners and down the side right there. The S is just that we've swamped um, the, um, the grains and the, the dust of the varnish really that was left after the scraping. And of course we needed to update the NLA in progress. Um, at the end of, I think it was weekly. So this was a, a, a way we could show our progress um, pictorially. It sounds um, like scratching varnish on an old map. Um, it does sound like you can do a lot of damage, but actually, and, and that the gels would be uh, softer, but actually this shows you um, that it was very precise actually, particularly with the UV light, so on the right there, uh, this was gold that you, you couldn't see with the varnish layer on, but when you, when you were scr scratched the varnish off, you still had the gold. So you, you could really retain what was beneath the varnish layer. It was a lot trickier over the third degree damaged areas, of course, particularly along the coastlines. But this is a, a good slide showing you that um, we could be very precise with the scratching method. Again, uh, the slide to the right, um, we, we discovered another uh, yellow pigment where those two arrows are indicating. Again, when, it, when the varnish was there, it just all blended into this sort of yellow orange um, color. But as the varnish slowly came off, 
more and more details were, were revealed. Libby indicated, um, you know, there's about 40 pieces of paper that make up this particular wall map. And there's different paper uh, in different areas of the map. The banner was very different uh, in terms of the pigments that were there as well. So these three slides here or images uh, show you on the left how it, how it came to our lab, the varnish on top. There we put a little bit of xanthan gum um, in the middle picture. It's just doing its thing. So it's, it's a poultice effectively holding the water over the map, but not releasing it in, uh, into the layers below. And then uh, we've removed uh, the xanthan and swabbed it. So it has taken the varnish off, but what we found is that the black pigment below was soluble. So it's a water-based, um, you know, it's probably a carbon-based pigment, but the binder uh, would be water-based, maybe a gum arabic or something like that. So we had to um, change the method of dealing with the banner. And what we did, uh, in order to achieve a better outcome there was we created um, what we call solvent chambers. And they sound very uh, technical when you say solvent chamber, but to give you an indication of um, how we come up with tools that really work well for us is um, go to uh, your local Chinese takeaway, um, order some rice, get the two Tupperware containers, cut out most of the bottom of one, so you've got one container that's whole, it's all got the bottom, cut out the bottom of the other, put in a bit of blotting paper uh, into the first one without the base cut out, put the one with the base cut out over the top of that, and then you can pour solvent onto the blotting paper. The pa that paper holds the solvent, which in this case was ethanol, and then we could just up in that and, and sit it over the banner. So no, none of the ethanol is dripping down onto the paper or surface of the map, but the solvent, the action is taking place. So the solvent is um, reactivating the varnish. So actually we left the varnish on the banner on this, we've just reformed it. And that's, that was the most effective way. And you can see um, where the red line is on the left, we haven't uh, reformed it, on the right we have, uh, and that really came up magically. Yeah. On the main part of the map, we discovered um, there was another dirt layer under the varnish. So we again mentioned previously, there were all these different layers that we could detect. Some we could see to begin with from the get go, but others we discovered over time. So this layer of dirt is soluble in water. Um, I remember Bryony maybe testing it. Um, we discovered it was a starch. Um, it contains starch. So whether that was starch that had been applied perhaps as a size to the, the paper or um, as the adhesive to um, adhere the linen backing on, um, we don't know, but it was there. We found that um, direct swabbing was too aggressive, but again, um, xanthan gum um, came to our rescue and it provided the slip uh, that we needed. Um, and we weren't putting it on as a gel in this instance. We were just um, rolling cotton swabs, dipping a very um, dipping the swab into xanthan gum, a very minimal amount, and then just agitating that over the areas of the map, and then again clearing just with um, a wet swab of water. In the end, we were left with a lot of areas uh, which needed consolidation and some repair. So we did spend many hours. Um, going over the map, every, every square of the map and looking at, uh, we needed to stabilize it because of course it had to leave us, travel back to the NLA and uh, the NLA needed, it needed to be exhibitable. So we didn't, they didn't need, we wanted it to be in a state where they didn't need to touch it physically and give it any more conservation treatment. So um, areas where there was, Verdigris and that were very friable. We used gelatin as an adhesive, and areas of paper that were lifting without any verdigris present, we used wheat starch based. 
Of course, the map travel to us, I remember when it was at the NLA, a lot of this was already done as well in order to uh, enable it to come down to Melbourne. So it has had progressive uh, treatments along the way. Because it was so um, friable uh, when it arrived in our lab initially, we, we couldn't really see what the verso looked like, what the back of it looked like. Um, of course, we could lift a corner, but um, we couldn't flip it over because a lot of the map, um, a lot of fragments would have just dropped off. So after we'd done all the work on the front, uh, it was really nice to be able to, to flip it over and then of course turn it back and see that, you know, it was, it was still um, all integrated and a whole. But this gives you um, an interesting perspective on the map. Um, Libby was talking about the drape before when they when they hang. So they do um, change their their physical um, not, not structure, but um, just how they lie changes over time. Um, we needed to get it flat because um, it's the map is very vulnerable when it is undulating, particularly on the peaks, because everything wants to sort of um, shear off. Um, but we didn't uh, press the life out of it, but in order for the treatment to progress, we did need a flat planar surface to work on. Uh, there's a little bit of retouching. This is very minor. So this is really just to um, reintegrate it visually. So it is very, very minor intervention here. And the retouching that we do, we always put down what we call a barrier layer. So that's a very a thin layer of a reversible adhesive, and then we apply the color over the top of that so it can be removed if needed to be done so uh, in the future. Um, and then, of course, we had to uh, mount it so that it could be exhibited and displayed. So, this is just a um, cross section of the structure that we came up with, it had a, a strainer on the back of hardwood. We had archival card screwed together, the polyester felt lining. So it's quite a soft cover for the, the mount board and then washed linen over the top. So it's black linen over the top, which this particular map, uh, we have Marion Parker there stitching the borders of the map um, to the linen. So it's not black, that's the other ones, isn't it? The companion maps. Marion, I uh, should probably mention this, but I always remember, um, Marion is excellent at stitching and sewing. Um, if you were to look at this map, you might not think so because um, she only used the existing holes. So she didn't put any new holes in. So it's all over the place, which might give you an indication what the Blau workshop was like. Just, I imagine they were incredibly busy and just really, what was it like over a thousand maps they produced to this scale so that we know of. Yeah, the, the battens, particularly uh, the bottom batten, which is at the top of this slide in the picture, has the finials on it. So they project out um, quite a lot from the surface of the map. So we countersunk those into the backing board and drape the cloth down into those. And then um, Marion stitched the border of the map down onto the cloth backing. Uh, my colleague and I, Geordie Cassasaius, have attached these battens, they're not actually um, attached to the map. They're actually floating over the, the map here and we'll just um, put some framers wire over them um, to hold them in place. And this was a visit from some of our friends who helped us with uh, all the admin necessary to work on a project uh, to this scale. So they came for a visit at the end of the project. So that's some of the team there. And then uh, crating up, TED and IAS were involved in this and they did a, an amazing job. I think they had a very, sh a very short visit to uh, work out the dimensions and it was like millimetre perfect. They just turned up with this magnificent crate and Libby and I just slotted it in. And it was, um, we didn't have to touch it after that. Back up to Canberra one day. Yeah, I mean, the map, uh, Libby mentioned uh, all this, these map projects five years in the making. Um, yeah, I, I sort of 
I was in Canberra soon after it arrived in, in Melbourne to do the work and transported it back up to Canberra. Um, and then I actually fell out of the truck and um, no one saw me. And I didn't tell my managers at the time, but um, I kind of, I, yeah, I did fall quite heavily from the top of the truck and um, I just thought, oh, it's going to kill me, this thing. <laughs> but um, yeah, it hasn't. And then two more turned up and yeah, I did really enjoy it. They didn't kill me either. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is unveiling the NLA, and this will be a, I think it'll just fade to before and after. I'll do that again. So that's before, so it gives you an indication. So, yeah, that was the first, the first one. So, yeah. Thanks, Peter, and thanks, Bryony. Um, we'll go I'd like to introduce our next speaker, which is, who is Marion Parker. Uh, so, Marion Parker, and I don't thinking of how to apply it, but that's all right. I'll just tell you about Marion. Marion is a <laughs> Marion is a textile conservator extraordinaire and textile historian. And uh, Marion did the very, very careful detailed um, uh, mounting of the first the first well map. And um, as Peter said, uh, it was stitching just through the the lining onto the backing board, um, and then there was a lot of you know. Um, saga to do with the trim and but one of the things Marion is notorious for going down rabbit holes and she went down an amazing rabbit hole with this project which is she did research into the two different linen linings um, and so she's here to talk to us today about that. Actually before I move on though I sort of flash back to one point from Peter's talk which is to say that the, uh, the takeaway food containers that we used were new and they did not come from an online <laughs> trim. We bought new ones um, but on that note, I'll pass you over to you. Um, I think stitching through the holes along the edge of the map, and go, I had to go through the holes that were already there. Don't think here and Vivi that this is not my stitching. It's it's wobbling all over the place. This is never how I would normally stitch. <laughs> I had to make that very clear. But I think um, just being part of that chain of workers and being a pair of hands uh, in such a long chain, all the hands that have helped create that object and passed it on from the workshop, the weavers who wove it, who gathered the fiber. And I think that's what just gives me such a sense of joy in working with these historic objects. I love being a little more than this pair of hands. It's pretty rare for me to get up in this position. I like being down in the lab without an audience, but we'll get through it together. <laughs> <laughs> so my job was to provide the support for the team to do the conservation well in that I needed to find out what I could about the fibre structure of the map that was, that was there um, because it helps understand how things behave how it's going to interact with the fact that it's the paper layer. Textiles can often be quite interactive with the paper. And often at this stage, we, they're lucky to have the same content. They're lucky to have fiber in the paper form, which is in the mesh up form. Um, so they're quite interactive materials. So my job is to look at what sort of um, manufacturing techniques have been used, what sort of weave it was, identifying the fiber type, and then using that to inform the kind of treatment that I would do, and also using that to inform um, how, how it's going to live, how, how it's going to behave. And then, this is just a very basic sample of the walk in the weft direction. Um, for those of you who are not textile buffs, uh, I think of the walk is the, the skeleton goes with fabric and that it needs the structure to be able to stand up. And this informs how the map will behave because usually, and it's not always the case, I assume, the warp is the vertical and it's the most strong, it's the highest twist in the in the fibre. So things like um, the threads here are much more likely to be more highly twisted and the twist gives the strength to the fibre. And it's a way of identifying 
which is the direction that they want to constrain to lie in the object and it will inform where it's going to be most easily modeled and that kind of thing. And the weft, I think of it as what is the weft is the fill. So it's it's often a lower twist level, and you can actually see here. This is the line that's in direct contact with the object. You can see the fibers that go along here. They're quite, they're quite fat, and they're often they're often just used to fill up the structure. So they're often not as um, they're not as important structurally. And one of the best ways you can find out more about what's in it is microscopy. Uh, it's a non-invasive non -invasive technique, and I wanted to be able to inform myself about how to go about the treatment and what it was made of about, you know, obviously treading as lightly as possible on the object. So this is the microscopy of finding one, which is in direct contact with the map and it's likely to be the oldest part of the, um, the oldest part of the lining and the, the second lining against the, the second lining against the first lining <laughs> um, is likely to be more recent. So. This is a transmitted light. And this again is that when you look at this, I just I look at something like this and I think this I would expect it to be linen. Um, most of the documentation and the research at the time says that things are linen, but again, never assume because the microscopy actually has these ribbon light structures. And this ribbon like structure here with a convolution and some twists along here, and that's indicative of cotton. So there is linen there, and I have looked at it under higher um, higher magnification cross polars with a dark field light. So you can see here, this is actually the diagnostic feature of linen with the cross nodes. So there is there is linen, there's also cotton. Um, and from what I've read from Dutch linen manufacturing, it's, a, it's quite it's a very complicated field. I think linen was used in a way which we have it's quite hard to understand what it would mean at the time. Um, because People understood the grade, they understood what it was for, they understood the different weeds, they understood almost exactly what it would cost by looking at it. And I think we've lost that material literacy when we look at it ourselves. Um, so this is quite a high density weave. It's not an even spin. You can see all the variations in the fiber twist. It's got low twist widths. It's got a higher twist warp, and that makes sense. That all makes sense to me. It could be a linen and a cotton blend. And um, so I think not wanting to sample across the whole object because that's too invasive, I think it just helps us understand that there's either a contaminant present from the second lining and that it's wholly linen and this is an anomaly, or that it's a linen and cotton blend. So, looking at the back was really exciting. I actually had to wait, <laughs> had to wait ages to look at the back because we couldn't turn it over for quite a while. Um, and I was able to see the whole loom width for this for the back part of it. Uh, and this was not possible for the front part of the object, the lining one, because I could only see it in the little holes in the map. But this time you can actually see the loom width, which is 740 millimetres. And this is what helps me to research the um, background and the manufacturing techniques in that um, the old measuring systems were actually an L. I don't know if anybody's heard of the term L, but um, it's one of my favourite archaic fabric terms because it's the end of your fingertips to your elbow. Um, and that's that's where the, the name comes from, which I think is quite beautiful. It's one of those old measuring systems of using the human body to 
um, get your everyday jobs done, you know. But one of the things with elves is that the whole of the European system had different, it actually made different things, each different country. There was an English L, a French L, a Scottish L, and a Flemish L. So in this context, I think the Flemish L is the most relevant one, but it, it basically means that it's as far as somebody can throw the shuttle when they're weaving the, when they're weaving, it's as far as somebody can throw the shuttle without having another person sitting beside them. So you can really only do it about that far. Um, and it's just one of those beautiful details that helps you understand what sort of technique it would have, what sort of technique it would have um, been. And, um, you know, those, I do go down the rabbit hole with things like that. <laughs> so once I had a look at the salvage, salvage word, and then again, just going into the microscopy of the lining too. And you can see here, it's actually got a far, it's got a far looser weave, and this will inform the behavior of the object. And that, um, conversely, the air, air and moisture actually affects a looser weave to a far greater degree than a tighter weave. So this would inform the behavior of the object overall. Um, and surprisingly, we identified cotton, and you can see we can see these are diagnostic features of cotton. You can see that turn there, um, and that actually tells me that it was pre-mercerization of cotton fiber, um, which dates before the 1700s, because the mercerization pattern takes some of the evolution out. It actually makes it straighter along here. Um, so it's just one of the ways that we can understand the object. And under cross polars, yeah, it, we can see some of the other diagnostic features of cotton, and it doesn't have the cross polars that we have in this. So that's quite, quite clear that cotton fiber here. Yeah. And this is possibly the kind of loom that would have constructed it. So uh, if anybody's up in Sydney, you can probably see this. But that's what, that's what I was saying about the loom width, is that somebody could sit here and cast their arm across to that point there. And there's some of the synonyms that Lennon had at the time. There are actually about 17. There's so many different ways you can describe the cloth. Um, but I think with, with the information that I gained, I think it's pretty safe to say that it was it was a very similar type of room to this it's one that constructed what was in the back of a um, map. <laughs> and all this work on all these rabbit holes just helped me to choose what was appropriate for the treatment. And this was choosing the edge binding and choosing an appropriate colour getting the appropriate texture, something that would sit with the object, not draw the eye, um, and yet respond to humidity in the same way that the object would, and that would have similar flexibility. So I chose a very fine linen tape, and I chose a beautiful fine French thread, the wax finish, which reduces the abrasion as the stitch goes through the original holes. And I just did a very simple treatment, attached it to the board gently, it will contract and expand with, with the paper layers, with the textile layers. And it was a huge journey around so many centuries of linen and loom widths and manufacturing and fibres and a whole other microscopy, which I really loved. And thank you to all the team. It was just such a pleasure. Thank you, Marianne. Um, so we're going to move on to the companion maps now, the next two. So just when... Um, we nearly killed Peter. Uh, we tried to kill him again with two more maps this time. Um, so I won't introduce Peter again because you know him, but uh, I will introduce Christine Mitzi. So Christine, uh, we were very, very lucky to have as a paper intern. 
uh, with us. So I was lucky enough to teach her as a paper conservation student and then to have her as an intern in the paper lab. Uh, and she was a really, really integral uh, part of this process. Um, and one of the, the skills in particular I think she brought to it is uh, Christine has a, has a printmaking background. Um, and that printmaking background, I think, gave her these really, really high level, uh, like precise hand skills. And I think in the coming presentation, you'll see where this, this came into play. So I'll pass over to Peter and Christine. Sort of want to do this now, just a few thank yous, um, partly so I don't forget at the end. Yeah, I'll, I'll do some thank yous now, partly because um, there were different teams working on each map as well. So apart from the people, that have spoken today. Uh, we had, we've had three managing directors in our time. So Jude Fraser, and Chris, and Chris Stevenson, yes, and um, Penny Tripp as well, who's here today. Um, there were many, many hands um, involved at the NLA. So Martin, of course, uh, Robin Tate was the um, Head of the paper lab there at the time, Daniil Clowley. Um, and we also had two conservators uh, towards the end of the first map that came down and did a couple of days work with us, uh, Sarah Freeman and Janet McDonald. Um, I'm sure I've, I'll forget the name, so I apologize in advance uh, for that. Our team, uh, Stephanie Alexander, Caroline G, conservation scientists who were key in analysing the map to begin with. Um, Danielle Woodward, Geordie Casasayas. Um, we also, we have um, a lot of other conservatives. We have a range of labs at the Green Maid Centre. So it's fantastic because we can always dialogue with them. So the paintings team um, in particular were very helpful. Catherine Nunn, Vanessa Kowalski, Katie Glenn, uh, Noni Zachary, Jacinta Brown, Victoria Thomas, and Lola Saunders, um, and I'm sure this was. Um, above all, all of those, um, like, it's hard enough managing a project um, at the best of times, but Libby managed all three maps, the project for all three maps, um, did a great job, and um, yeah, like always had our back. Um, and also, there's just so much admin going in the background. Um, so Libby, you know, I could go up the scaffold, um, you know, Brian and I were up there, Christine and could walk around the map, Marion can along. We, we didn't have to deal with any of those issues. So thanks to them for that hard work. Um, okay, swap glasses. So the next companion maps. Uh, We've seen these before, but you can already see uh, quite a different map, particularly on that right side where there's a lot of uh, damage there. A lot, a lot dirtier. I guess uh, the NLA map, the varnish had degraded, but it, it had also done a good job of protecting it as well. So it's a kind of, it's pros and cons with varnish. These maps weren't varnished, uh, so the papers uh, directly exposed to the environment that it's in. As Martin said before, they're hanging, often hanging above fireplaces, so people are smoking, things are getting thrown around the room. Um, we wondered if uh, this map had been shot, maybe bullet holes. We, we had no idea, but um, they're just you know, exposed to so many more conditions that can affect uh, their life. This is the Asia map. Um, if you can recall from the video that Libby showed of us raising this map up, uh, it was the verdigris hadn't degraded as much on this map, so it was still uh, vibrant green in parts, but there were also areas of brown uh, degradation where it probably has gone degraded to uh, as far as it's going to go. So it's, the green's completely gone. It's now brown. Uh, in that video, when we're lifting it, you could see through the map. So it's very, um, it's robust in some ways. Like these could be handled and hung vertically and we could handle them in that way. But they're also very frayed and fragile in parts as well. So 
um, you know, sort of different different uh, maps altogether and different treatment priorities as a result. So, of course, this was the same. We wanted to prolong the map's life, long-term preservation, return it to an exhibitable condition where it's really um, make it more robust so that it can be displayed at minor. Um, we had to conserve. We couldn't, like, unlike the NLA map, for instance, we couldn't remove the battens from this map. Um, I mean, if we had endeavoured to do that, we would have damaged them. So we had to do the conserva conservation work with them in situ. Um, we need to stabilise vulnerable areas of paper and to wash if possible. So. Um, different treatment priorities, um, and of course the vertebrae raised its head again. So we began with the usual documentation, examination. At this point, we have Noni and Christine on the right-hand side, they've done what we call dry cleaning, and this particular method is using a brush vacuum. So very fine brushes um, with a vacuum that has a, a mesh over the nozzle, we can control the amount of suction. And we went over the surface of the maps and brushed uh, all the loose surface dirt as much as we could up into the vacuum. And you can see at the top on the right image, um, at the top, uh, you can get it quite clean in the bottom of the dirt. We haven't tackled in that area yet. We also uh, did, you know, there's dry cleaning and then there's wet cleaning. When you mentioned we wash paper regularly in the lab. We also did what we call moist cleaning. Um, and again, we're using the same agar rose that Bryony showed you in the first map. Uh, we would basically take, it's derived from seaweed. Um, it comes to us in a very uh, refined white, pure white powder. We mix that with water, heat it up. When it cools, it forms a gel. So we work out the percentage um, of the agar rose to water. So we were working typically with a 5% gel. So we would make uh, slabs of this gel and then we would grate it up just with like a cheese grater. This is the results of, of Noni's and Christine's work there. On the right, you can see uh, a white uh, grated gel there. Uh, and then in the little Petri dish, uh, the same gel when it's been agitated over the surface of the map. It's a way of picking up a bit more of that ingrained dirt on the surface, but keeping the um, introduction of moisture to a minimum. Then we began to uh, move on to the washing. Uh, and so we started out with small gel plugs, similar to the one, if you remember from Bryony's first presentation, those very small plugs, and just to see what we could achieve. Uh, and then we progress to larger pieces like this with a barrier layer of tissue on the left between the gel and the map. And you can see when the, when the gel forms, uh, the higher percentage you use makes the gel denser. And the denser it is, the smaller the pores inside the, the gel. And those pores act as capillaries. So the water, you put uh, some weight on top, so the water in the gel um, can move to some extent into the paper that uh, solubilizes um, some of the same staining and then the capillaries do their work and draw that up into the gel. You remove the gel, you remove some of the stain or reduce. Um, the verdigree issue is different with this map. Um, well, some components are the same, but because the verdigree wasn't as degraded on this map and we were able to wash this one to a much greater extent, um, we really wanted to test to see if our washing techniques were going to you know, create more degradation or whether we could do it in a very controlled and safe manner. So we experimented in different ways. So here you can see we've drawn an overlay on the map. So we used tracing paper, transferred it to white paper, We've cut out little windows and they're sitting over the coastline where the vertigree pigment is present. And then we put on the washing gel. And then after that, we've gone back and 
We just needed to see through washing whether we were migrating those three cop irons through the paper and moving it, because if that was going to happen over time, the paper would degrade. Um, you know, we'd move the copper degradation throughout the paper rather than it just being along the coastline. Uh, so we did find that there was movement. Um, so we were able to test this by again using the agar rose little plugs and we would wash with the gel, uh, sorry, with the, um, the agar rose gel. We'd come back with a plug and we'd sit it on those areas and then we could test those plugs for copper. And we found that, yes, we were migrating it. So we needed to find a solution uh, to this. We tried uh, different things. Uh, we, we, some of our research had indicated that uh, by applying gelatin onto the vertigree that that was able to restrict the movement of the free copper. But of course, that would have been introducing a lot of moisture um, into those, those areas of vertigree. So then we tried uh, silicon solvents, which um, are a way of, um, you, you can brush these solvents on, they move down into the paper and they, they bind everything below the surface. And so it gives you a window of time to work on the surface. But we found that they weren't very effective in this case and they also didn't give us uh, the working time that we needed. So I'll hand over to Christine now to see what we came up with. As has been previously mentioned, copper-based pigments have been used extensively throughout these two maps to highlight the coastlines and mountain ranges and throughout the cartouches. Our tests with agarose gel blocks supplied to the text panels had proven that paper degradation products could be significantly reduced through the capillary action of the gels. However, this also directly introduced moisture to the paper for prolonged periods of time. As we've previously established, the introduction of moisture to copper containing pigments is problematic as it can cause the release of free copper ions into the surrounding paper, where it will catalyze the degradation of cellulose fibers, eventually leading to losses. To facilitate the gel block washing of these maps, while protecting the copper containing pigments to the introduction of moisture, a range of materials and methods were tested. In accordance with recent research into copper stabilization on paper, a solution of 3% gelatin in deionized water was applied to the green media in several locations. The aim of this was to complex the free copper ions and to convert them into a more stable form. And therefore they would be unable to degradate, deg cause degradation to the surrounding paper. Through our trials, we found that applying this solution was difficult to control and even appeared to encourage the lateral movement of copper across the paper. As the test strips available to us could not differentiate between copper co complexed copper and free copper ions, we were unable to accurately determine if this conversion had taken place and therefore inhibit further degradation of the paper. It was therefore decided the movement of copper in any form was undesirable and that we sought a new treatment pathway to temporarily seal off the copper so that it could not interact with moisture. As such, a combination of cyclomethacodons were trialed. These are a type of silicon-based solvents that come from the cosmetics industry. Sorry. These are a type of silicon-based solvents that come from the cosmetics industry and have recently been used in conservation as a protective film for fragile materials while wet cleaning. However, in our small-scale tests, we found that we were unable to provide sufficient protection against the introduction of moisture when placed under weighted gels for prolonged periods of time. Finally, cyclododicane was trialled, and we found it to effectively protect copper-based pigments from the introduction of moisture, even when applied under pressure. 
This is a waxy-like white substance which forms a protective barrier that water cannot penetrate. After a certain amount of time, the cyclododecane sublimates away, transitioning from a solid straight to a gas and skipping the liquid phase, leaving behind no residue. You got it Experimentation with several gel application techniques found that this was most easily controlled when applied with warm, applied warm with a fine brush. As cyclododecane was applied, as such, cyclododecane was applied to all areas of the map bearing copper-based pigments, including all areas that had still appeared green, as well as the fully degraded copper areas that had transitioned to brown. After mitigating the risks of copper migration, we were able to begin washing the internal map region. As we contemplated the task ahead, it became apparent very quickly that walking, working in small sections designated by the engraved latitude and longitude lines, as had been done with the previous flower map treatment, was impractical. Initially, we increased the size of these gels to one third of an individual engraving, and then very quickly increased the size of these blocks to the size of one engraved sheet, one sixth of the map. Along with increasing the size of the gels, the amount of weight applied was also increased. It was found that as the gel blocks became larger, it became more difficult to apply even pressure, resulting in an inconsistent wash that did not fully replicate the success of our smaller scale gel applications. Gradually, the weights were built up, first with perspex and lead shot weights, until we were finally using the stack of pressing boards you can see here. It was necessary to build up the backing around the battens as this was a fully intact mat with the battens still in place and not removed. This ensured that when we applied the, mat, uh, the weights to the map, these battens were fully supported and we caused no further damage. The technique used to wash the map, wash in the map region followed the protocol previously established during our testing and washing panels, washing of the text panels. The map was washed in two passes of 5% Agaro's rigid gel blocks with thin Japanese tissue barrier. Cotton wool was placed on the top to further aid in the capillary actions of the gels before adding weights. In the first pass, the gels were adjusted to a relatively low conductivity and applied for 120 minutes to encourage free copper ions contained within the paper to be pulled up into the gels along with the degradation products. In the, second, in the second pass, the conductivity of the gel blocks were adjusted to a higher conductivity and applied for 180 minutes to drive beneficial calcium ions back into the paper. Handling the gels at this size was difficult and required two people to lift and place accurately on the map without breaking. As we became more confident in handling the oversized gels and their efficacy in removing the degradation products, we were able to increase the number of gel blocks on the maps at any one time. Here on the right, you can see not only how effective the gel blocks were at removing the discoloration from the paper, but also the success of the cyclododecane at protecting the copper-based pigments, pigmented areas from the moisture as shown by the ghosts of the coastlines, rivers and mountains left behind in the gel. This method was somewhat complicated by the presence of elaborately painted cartouches on both maps, which both included thick and thin applications of watercolor and gouache. Although earlier solubility testing had indicated that these paints were not soluble, the decision was made not to apply gel block cleaning over these regions and avoid washing altogether. This decision was threefold based on the significant pressure moisture was being applied with, the amount of time, and the little expected visual improvement that could be gained from it. Instead of covering the whole cartouche with a solid block of cyclododecane, the cartouche region was cut away from the gel blocks so that it would not make any contact. A protective sheet of thick mylar, larger than the gel blocks, was placed on the map, and the gel box placed in the correct position on the mylar. A scalpel was then carefully used to cut out and remove the gel over the cartouche. The gel blocks were then delicately lifted off the map, the mylar removed, and the gel block re precisely returned to the correct position so that washing could take place following the established protocols. Overall, 
the washing process removed significant discoloration and reduced the staining while improving the contrast and clarity in both maps. It also improved the flexibility of the paper and the distortions across its surface. After the washing was completed and the map had dried, cyclododecane was allowed to sublimate away. This was a simple process that took place over several weeks and required only ventilation to facilitate its transition from a waxy white solid to a gas, leaving no trace behind on the paper. After complete sublimation of the cyclodotape had taken place, further testing with copper indicator strips were undertaken. The positive result, as indicated by the purple color from the green pigment region, and the negative result immediately adjacent to it, had confirmed that the treatment had not caused lateral movement of copper ions and had effectively removed any previously migrated copper. Um, you observe the look of the pristine baby before we came over. I really like that look. <laughs> uh, great to work with, very precise, um, and always in control. So if I can only just a second, yeah. just apologies, Christine, you're, you're under control there. Um, okay, this is the last bit. Um, this is a slide, uh, Jacinta Brown, who was the textile conservator working on this, these particular maps. She needed to, there were, there were more tears um, to the lining of, the, of these maps and also there wasn't a secondary lining to these maps. So um, we could get access to the, to the um, lining that was in, in direct contact with the paper. So here, um, Jacinta needed access uh, beneath this uh, piece of paper that you can see wetted out on the left slide. So she asked me if I could uh, remove that. So just by um, moistening it, humidifying it, and then gently um, lifting it off. So the paper uh, was stuck down with a starch-based adhesive. So just by moistening it, leaving it for a little bit of time, um, it begins to lift. So I was able to remove that. Jacinta could then access the fibres beneath and do her repairs. And here you can see that she's um, done some, uh, some repairs with linen thread. Uh, sometimes that wasn't possible. Sometimes um, there wasn't the, the amount of paper that I would have had to remove to enable access for Jacinta was too it was too large an area. So in that in those instances, we would uh, flip the map over and use another technique, typically uh, a Japanese paper repair on the back that was toned to match the, the colour of the, the thread surrounding the holes. Here's just a close-up in, image. I think they're Noni's hands there, realigning some of the, the very damaged and lifted pieces of, of paper on the one of the text panels. So there was a lot of that work. Um, and of course, we needed had to have cleaned these pieces of paper because if we were introducing any moisture in the adhesive, starch paste to stick these pieces of paper down, we would most likely call, cause tide lining and further staining to the map. So a lot of work done before we could get to this point. And of course, uh, similar to the NLA map where we were presented with a bag of lots of loose pieces, these maps also had a lot of loose fragments. And sometimes actually these fragments had been stuck down previously at some point in their life and they weren't always aligned uh, correctly. So there was a fair bit of um, work towards the end of the treatment, lifting these and finding them. And, and uh, Christine and I spent many hours um, with a jigsaw puzzle trying to work out where the text uh, went back down. And we didn't always find where, where they would went, where they would go, because you can imagine sometimes it's just one individual letter. So it's, it's literally, it'd be very hard to find. It was very hard to find where they go. And then uh, some work to clean up the battens, so swabbing them uh, just with deionized water, cotton swab. Um, because the battens couldn't be removed on these maps, you can imagine, particularly on the, on the lower battens, um, over time, a lot of dust and soot presumably uh, falls down from the top of the map or from the room 
and collects on that bottom pattern. So they were particularly dirty in, in those areas and also where the map is fed in between the splice patterns. I think it was just one of the maps. Um, there was a finial missing on one of the bottom battens. So we um, found a local wood turner to replicate uh, the finial. So there he is on his lathe turning the finial, creating the new one. And then Geordie back in the lab um, with gesso, the white uh, ground layer there, and then just layers of different paints to build up. And then uh, I know that he really enjoyed uh, distressing it in that bottom right slot and slide uh, to make them look um, like they'd been weathered and, and left them out for a long time. Here's just a couple of shots of um, the mount board and the structure of it. Timber strainer, the archival layers of board that it's mounted onto, the black um, cloth to provide the background, and then Geordie and I fixing the battens in place again with uh, framers wire tone to match the batten, the colour of the batten, threaded through the board and then tied up the back. Christine doing a little bit of retouching. This is this uh, very minimal, actually, even less than the in our A map in, the, in these ones. Crated up. We made the crates in this instance um, to return them. And I think this is just again before treatment, fading to after treatment. To that again, because it's always nice to see. And this is the Asian one. And that's the team. Thank you. Thank you, Peter and Christine. Um, one little thing I think that we missed in the process was that um, the uh, the silk trim was also washed. It's not true, so that had been gently swabbed and it was also done by Jacinta. Um, and, yeah. And so the final presentation today, and this is um, uh, Victoria Thomas, who was also a textiles conservator with us. We were going through textiles conservators fast at this stage. Um, who's now lovely Victoria's coming on to, to work at Art Lab. Um, but Victoria did some really beautiful work to replicate the, the silk tassels. I think I harassed them on, on very, very early on about how I thought the tassels were very, very super special and that we should get them replicated. Um, and I don't think Xenon ever came, but I think David's team came through in the end and, and Tori um, and Tori made the, the replica tassels for display. Um, so unfortunately, the original ones were the silk was just too brittle for them to ever to be safe. They were just shedding like crazy. Um, and I'll just pick through and Tori's, um, she's on holiday at the moment, but she's pre-recorded a little video from us about her process. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Victoria Thomas. I'm a textiles conservator currently working at Art Lab Australia in uh, Tantania, Adelaide on Ghana land. But at the time of the conservation of the two companion maps, Archipelagus Orientalis and Asia Descriptor Novissima, I was working as a textile conservator for Grimway Conservation Services and was able to assist with uh, the replication of the silk tassels, uh, specifically um, in reproducing the colour. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Uh, I'll be talking about the decision-making process behind replicating rather than restoring or conserving and about the colour reproduction using modern synthetic dyes. So several components, or several textile components of the two maps historic mounting have survived, which include passimentary of the two silk tassels hung with braid around the two ends of the top hanging battens. Uh, the silk in this in these uh, tassels is similar to the block trim that is positioned on the edges of each map um, and which also appears in several maps from the Blau workshop from around this time. Um, we can't be certain that these uh, tassels are 100% original. They're certainly historic. Um, but stylistically, the trimmings are typical of 17th century interior soft furnishing trends, for which, which for the wealthy, tended towards the elaborate and decorative. Um, maps, too, were part of this domestic decorative lexus of showpieces, grandeur, that sort of thing. So it was very exciting that some of this original material has survived, you know, silk 
um, textiles and certainly silk are prone to degrading over time and often get lost. Um, however, the silk that we were presented with, with was assessed as being much too fragile for ongoing display. The maps, tassels and braids were partially intact, but at an advanced stage of degradation, they were severely faded, soiled and shedding when lightly handled. We know as silk ages, the fibres tend to become acidic, cross-linked at the molecular level, all things which lead to embrittlement and breakage, which we observed with these uh, surviving components. Additional factors like pollution and soiling through the lap of display, poor handling and storage, insect damage and extensive periods of light exposure would all be things that would have likely accelerated the natural aging and degradation of the silk. Um, additionally, uh, soiling from years of display detracted from the lustrous quality of the fibres and the evidence of the original but now faded colours, which would have been quite vibrant red and gold. The gold certainly survived, has well, has faded less than the red. So instead of, um, you know, repairing, reinforcing the degrading silk, we decided instead to replicate the tassels to make the historic mode of display legible. Uh, our professional ethical framework does elevate authenticity um, as one of the key factors in decision making when we make, um, you know, decisions about how to conserve historic objects. But we you know, it's also a part of that ethical framework that we are tasked with making cultural heritage items legible to contemporary stakeholders. So this played into the, into the decision making with regard to displaying the maps with the replicated parts. Replication does have a strong precedence in conservation as a strategy for extending the display life of very vulnerable materials, which include textiles. Um, textiles and especially those coloured with dyes from natural, so plant or insect sources are particularly vulnerable to light-induced degradation, which is accumulative and irreversible. As such, historic dyed textiles have very limited lifespan for display or may well be past this already. Um, they might have been too damaged on display in excessive light for too long or they might just be completely missing components of a composite part work. So here are some examples where replication has been uh, used as a strategy of extending or enhancing the life, uh, the display life of these historic textiles. And this is sort of the um, tradition that we were working in and thinking about when um, we made the decision to replicate the tassels. Um, so Putting the tassels on display would have also put mechanical strain on the already weak fibres. The way they're mounted is looped through a small hole in the upper batten and then sort of um, twisted around that. Um, and we want to, we definitely want to avoid any kind of mechanical strain on something that's already breaking apart with just light handling. So the Tassels were extremely weak. Um, why not just leave them off yet? We wanted to still make the display of these maps as prestige items legible. This is an intangible characteristic of the maps, which is portrayed through a series of tangible signifiers, which include the tassels. As conservators, we're now well aware that we're involved in conserving both the tangible and intangible values of objects and we know how our work plays a part in creating visitors' experience of these multi-layered tangible and intangible values. Although a small part of the whole map, the tassels represent an important component of the map's history and cultural value. By replicating the tassels, we sought to preserve some of the original mode of display, which tells a story about the map's history of presentation, its grandeur and its cultural value as a showpiece, as well as a significant cartographic document. Um, by reconstructing and through the reconstructing process, we were also able to increase the legibility of information about the trimming's original construction, which has historic craft interests. And certainly um, when Jacinta reconstructed the braid, we were able to learn more about, um, you know, that sort of passimetry technique. So 
for the process, um, I was involved in the colour reproduction uh, of the replica tassels. Um, it wasn't absolutely necessary to positively identify the original dye stuff in order to reproduce a facsimile for the real thing. Um, we know from historic primary sources like dye recipes and previous studies of similar textiles using anal analytical techniques um, that the original reds and golds could have been achieved using colorants extracted from common natural sources, which are still available to natural dyes today. Uh, these include things like cochineal, Kutch, matter, and fustic. Um, however, these dyes are neither color fast nor reliable in terms of bulk color reproduction. Uh, so while we had some idea of what the natural source of the dyes in the original silk would have been, and this informed our understanding of the object and sort of putting it in a historic context, uh, it wasn't necessary for the task of reproducing the color. Um, and this is generally true in conservation in general, sort of across um, specialties. Um, you know, we we tend to rely on contextual and direct color information to reproduce rather than historic recipes. Um, accurate chemical identification of dyes in particular involves destructive testing methods, which involve physical sampling followed by separation techniques that destroy the sample. So things like high performance liquid chromatography. So unless the identification of the dye has benefit beyond just simple identification, um, we want to avoid methods like this. So the process involved using synthetic dyes to replicate the color as opposed to natural dyes. Um, these are primarily used in textile conservation for their greater stability, uh, so light and wash fastness, and their greater reliability in reproducing color than natural dyes, which while they'd be authentic in terms of color, um, or chemical color composition, um, they can't always reproduce accurate color matches especially when the thing that we're replicating might be faded, which is the case with these tassels. So for protein fibres like silk, we use acid dyes, which rely on the acidic conditions of the dye bath to convert the negatively charged fibres into a cationic state, and then they'll be receptive to forming electrostatic bonds with the neg negatively charged water-soluble dyes. This is the same chemical bonding that results in uncolored fibers becoming colored in any dye process. Uh, but for these dyes, the reaction occurs over about 90 minutes. Um, during this time, the dye bath is heated in a controlled way to optimize the amount of dye uptake into the fiber. And we do like to achieve close to 100% uptake or exhaustion of the color onto the fibers, just to ensure that we can then accurately replicate the color for future batches and scale up the production. So in the image there, that was part of the testing stage. Um, so there's very small amounts um, that are absorbing or becoming colored by the dyes. Um, so the colors that we achieve with these modern synthetic dyes are formulated on red, yellow, blue combinations. Um, for this process, a series of test samples were produced with varying proportions of the base colours and then compared against the original silks in different light settings and by different conservators to determine which dye formulation would best represent the original components, faded red and gold colours. The process does take time um, and a level of precision to ensure that the test samples can be reproduced um, in bulk. Um, Fortunately, I was able to rely on a combination of learned knowledge um, as well as a series of reference samples that had been produced earlier that year as a lockdown activity. So it was sort of a very convenient uh, flow on from that work that I was doing. So once the colour formulation was established, um, I bulk dyed two skines of uh, or two different types of silk skines. So one was a two-ply silk yarn, which was used for the tassels, and one was a silk tassel, which was used for the braid because it gave better body. Um, the braid and the tassels were reconstructed by my colleague, Jacinta Brown, and uh, mounted on the, new, uh, well, on the new mounting system. The completed tassels were able to be threaded through the original mounting hole in the upper baton, which you can see 
in these images. And they now sit happily next to the conserved maps, telling a complete story of their historic mode of display. Thank you. And it's a very silly question for everyone should put um, not really relevant, but I do really want to dreamt about service of that map. Like did it walk in the dream service on it and continue to spread. I think I've been found in the microphone. That's it, sorry. Good question, you know. That is the, I'm still trying to get my head around the, um, there you go. I'm still trying to get my head around the banking fabric. I was wild about it. And with a couple of questions on this, was that? Same or very similar, um, to be the same as um, and secondly, um, we were having a discussion with Greg about um, there being two linings, and, uh, some problem and some explained um, in the presentation. But do you think the, I, I heard you had a bit of the UI bed thing, but some of it was introduced. Possibly as part of a later process or a peer process or happy process, and some of the content actually integrated as part of the board web. Is that correct or is that wrong? I think basically we sampled a small area from the pitch. Because that's something we did otherwise that needs to be and in this time of the day, the GI is water. Um, we had to remove the problem and we needed to understand what the numbers were and how they could be working in the main uh, projects. And we didn't take samples from multiple areas, which we, if we really needed to know that I could do that, we need a good reason to do so, what my sister was that it could be a contaminant from line two, which is the more recent lining. That lining came up with cotton, unrest, unrest rise, cotton plants, conditions. So, the characteristic of that lining. Um, lining one had the linen best fiber components, which are across, no, it's visible in, in as a diagnostic feature, but they. That same fiber line that we took is once you're forming your medication. You know, you think you're taking one fiber, but when you look at it under the floor, you've got a bowl of spaghetti. So I know I know from my research that a lot more bending happens than is thought um, from the constructive. Linen, anything that things we've got, that's consisted in such linen, they often mix the warp. Uh, they have the warp made of different colors and get to the left. So it's conjectural. I think it could be a contaminant because they're next to each other. I think it could be the warp is a different fiber to the left, but we didn't test in that level because we didn't, need, we didn't have a good enough reason to. And also, with lining one, I only had access through the moss area, so I only had access um, beneath the paper, so I couldn't tell the salvage bit. And I think it's about what level you need in these things. I mean, I think maybe not be too much. It would be, there's always more, and I think there's always more, but I think. Um, what I learned from that is never to pursue because I look at it and think, oh, that's just an unbleached Dutch linen. But the more I looked at it, 
they were the Dutch were growing linens all over the world and the Britain and Francis and Spain and elsewhere. They may really have been working in Amsterdam. Hmm. It's really fascinating. Does have I answered the question? Yes. <laughs> Whether any analysis has been done on that graph, I think it was too important. Like forensic, like forensic. Everyone's going to be excited, so I think I can respond. Um, I don't know, no, we haven't done this yet, and I don't think we need to change the graph. I'm all better than anyone in the service. The biggest thing I think we found from analysis of the surface is that we have the maximum of contamination. I was going a little bit CSI on it. I was going to go if you find more iron around those same holes, which would support one of the holes that have been shot. Um, but unfortunately, the iron has been dispersed a few times. So, so nothing at this stage, and I'm not. I'm not sure that the technology exists that allows us to, to establish problems based on that kind of service contamination. Um, and I will say also that, that as much as we have we have cleaned them, uh, we will tell you what crime. So if that technology has, does become available, this will be. And one question about the colour from this is a problem. Did you do anything with analysis between the past? I don't know. Um, I think it's mostly an hour that had a lot more colours have been used because gold is very, very different. Um, now, I have a much better margin here. My understanding is I think the color scheme actually should be a super is that correct? I don't know. I the the condition of the banner is significant. So the banner had this effect of creating the addition gold, golds and glows of a whole thing. And I, I think artistically, um, there were the decisions. For some reason, this is a presentation I like to do. And we have to do that to analyze the time. And we don't know what the implication is for, but it's been given the second map. I know the other map has, you know, the different colored um, battles, but, but I think this, in this case, they were adding gold for a particular reason. And I think that's something to do with the client base that they had to do with and who they were dealing with the project. I think there's something there in relation to the banners, which is a paper that don't think there was any original thought about the structure. But in the banner, the banner is put in two equal sized pieces and then two sides. The smallest piece on the right is the same size as the year, which would make you think that that was something that had been changed. So Go down with this map, we didn't go down on the subsequent map. 
it's not out of the question, it's, it's easy enough to do it to some extent, potentially easier to do it in any mass because we have more access to the line, there's so much more that is slow. So, well, we also did look at things like women and, and, and we have as far as knowledge in this area, I think there's definitely scope to sort of look into that. And I think that's one of the things that I've found so wonderful about working with these maps is there's just, you can just delve in in so many ways, you know, you can just keep an aspect of this PhD in that. I can certainly make them the game so it's sick. <laughs> a niche one. Have any further questions? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 If you have the mylar leaves, how would you get the mylar? I'm just trying to imagine it. So the mylar was used as basically a protective layer, so it would be part of the gel, so it would be part of the gel. So that was placed down first on the gel, and then placed down on the top of the repetition. We then had to lift up the gel of that number, which on the previous gel box to lift those gel blocks up uh, wasn't as difficult as they had their first gel box. With these ones, it's now the old one, and especially as the cartridges were on the bottom edge, they would be very weak. So it was basically the great difficulty just lifting them up gently, peeling them off the mylar, or rather, as it became easier to do, to lift the mylar over to the table, pull them off the mylar there, and then stick them back down. There. So it's just handling them in the market. Great is extremely different. I'd like to add this point to that, you know, the, the use of um, gel blocks in this way for washing paper is it's not that's it's reasonably used to come It's not. I, I haven't known anyone who's done it on a scale or level to be able to stay with on this project. But I think that's one of the really good outcomes for us from it is that discovering that you can use these blocks up to about 60 square and with that, you have some. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, I think we have to be careful. I'll conclude. <laughs> Can you all hear me? I've got multiple mics going now. So, um, Well, thank you all for coming. There's a couple of things I want to do. First, I want to thank our speakers. So Martin, Erica and Jane this morning and then Marion, Christine, Peter and Bryony this afternoon. Um, if we could have a round of applause for them. Thank you. Um, and just because we are running out of time, I think the way I want to bring all this together is to think about networks and collecting and how the various types of, of collections that we've worked with here and the infrastructure that sits within the need to look after those collections all comes together to give us a much richer understanding of our identity, our national position, our place in the world. So thinking about the collections and the the interrelationship between our national collections and our private collections and the, the significance of having that kind of rich um, infrastructure that supports scholarship in Australia. I think often the private collections and the national collections are touted as being in opposition to each other. I think that's not the case. I think that what we've seen today is the way in which People who invest in Australian culture and bringing Australian culture to Australians. That's the story that we've got here. And then the other story we've got is the story of institutions like the university that build the ecosystem around the skills base, not, 
not just in the treatment, but in the entire intergenerational development of that skills base. So the thing that I take from today is that we're, we're all existing in this really, really rich ecosystem and seeing today how we could all support each other and the kinds of revelations and value that comes out of that support, that's for me has been the, the really fascinating and rich part of the story that we've been able to bring today. So I want to thank Grimway Conservation Services. They do a fantastic job, an extraordinary job um, and a unique job in the country. Um, and Penny Tripp sitting up there a little bit behind the scenes, but as general manager, Penny has um, with Libby brought this together today. So I want to thank both of them as well. So thank you everyone for coming for your interest in, in this subject. And um, we will continue to think about ways that we can bring the work of remote conservation services out into a more public domain so that it's, it's can continue to spark the sorts of wonderful conversations. And I think the enrichment of the relationships that we already have, but bringing everyone together just kind of takes it to the next level too. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you.